Hello and welcome. This is your Algebra 1-2 final exam video review. This is for the spring semester. We're almost done! But maybe you guys got to learn a few more things and that's probably why you're watching the video, which is okay. That's why I make your videos for you. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, now this video is sort of scattered though, um, because you had two different packets. In one packet there were no problem numbers with them, so I do feel bad and I can't say what the numbers were, because there weren't any. So there were things on chapters 1 through 5. You guys asked for them, and I, I think I'm giving you most all of them. It's like 8 or 9 or 10 problems or so. You'll see them here. Anything you don't see there are probably answered in chapters 6 through 8. Um, there are probably around 20 problems total. So if you see, like, these are 9. Eh, maybe a little less than 20. But either way, we're going to go through all those. Nothing on chapter 9 on the inequalities, only because we didn't have any problems on them. Um... The emphasis really won't be on inequalities, but hopefully we did enough review of that stuff that you do know things on them, and if not, just let me know. Um, but if you do look at the time, it is 6.11, it is Friday night, you know, I got things to do, you got things that you're probably not watching Friday night anyway, but you know, we all got things to do, I'm not going to keep you around forever, so the, the unfortunate thing is, as I say these things, I'm probably not going to be teaching as much as I'm going to be doing the problem. So... But what you do have to remember is that not all problems are just like, oh, here's just another example of this kind of problem with different numbers. You still want to hear what I say and try and take things into account. So when there's a completely unique type of problem with the same concepts involved, you're ready to know how to do it. And that's what this video is for. I'm going to cover those problems with that in mind. Now I'm going to add a page so that I can type in these other review videos because maybe these other ones will be of more help to you than this one video by itself. So the first one I did for you was Chapter 3, and it looked like that. All the other ones, whoa, all the other ones after that, watch this, chapter 4 review, chapter 5 review, uh, I think chapter 5 actually was closure, because review, I, so I screwed up on my link on that one, chapter 7, chapter 8, we didn't do it, chapter 9. So you have video reviews for all your other um, videos right there. There they are. So you can go to those ones and those will be review videos for those individual chapters. I'm trying to give you as many resources as possible so you can study up. So I really hope that everything I get you will be good <laughs> for you. So you can go to those. Otherwise, have fun watching this video. Now, the first videos are going to be chapters. The first problems are going to be chapters one through five. If you want to jump straight to chapter six, go ahead. Okay, this first question, what are the steps for solving equations? Well, your steps are to simplify, isolate, then divide. Now, this is specifically, more specifically for linear equations. We've done exponential equations, and we have to do different things there. We have to factor, use zero product property. We may have to isolate, get everything on one side of the equation, and then quadratic formula, a lot of different things. But here, solve for x. And so whatever you're solving for, you're trying to get that by itself on one side of the equation. So here's your equation. Always keep your equation balanced. Whatever you do on one side, you must do to the other. You never do the same thing. Sorry. You never do multiple things on one side of the equation without changing the other side. So right here, simplify might mean like combining like terms. So 3x minus 7x is negative 4x. And that plus 4 equals. We have 5 minus 2x. This negative distributes into the 2x and the 7. So this will be 5 minus 2x minus 7. Notice it's not just minus 2x. If it was just minus 2x, there wouldn't be parentheses here. So really keep that in mind as you do that problem. That's where that negative takes place. Equals 5 minus 7 is negative 2. So I have negative 2x minus 2. We have simplified. Check. Next step is to isolate. Isolate meaning getting your x's just on one side of the equation, and it doesn't matter which side. I'm so used to getting x's on the left side of the equation, I might as well do that. So if I'm going to move my negative 2x over, I have to add it, because negative 2x plus 2x is 0. On this side, negative 4x plus 2x gives me negative 2x. Be careful with your math. Use a calculator if you have to. To move the 4's over, subtract 4, subtract 4. 4 minus 4 is 0, negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. So now I have an equation that says negative 2x equals negative 6. And divide, basically if there's something being multiplied in front of x, you then divide it. If it's a negative 2, divide a negative 2. And negative 6 divided by negative 2 is positive 3. So x equals 3. 
How do we know our equation is correct? Well, just like any other equation, we substitute our solution and check and see if our statement is true. So what I can do is substitute 3 into x for our original equation. We'll get 3 times 3 plus 4 minus 7 times 3 equals 5 minus 2 times 3 plus 7. 3 times 3 is 9. 7, negative 7 times 3 is negative 21. This is 5 minus 6 plus 7. 9 plus 4 is 13. 13 minus 21 is negative 8. 5, we'll get 5 minus 13. 5 minus 13 is also negative 8. Negative 8 equals negative 8. This checks out. Our solution was true. Let's make that a green check mark. That would make more sense. Maybe red X if we have to. Green check marks. Let's stick to that principle. I'm just going to jump straight through. I want to save as much time as possible. Okay, you guys ask for this problem here. How do we find the area of a rectangle? How do you find the perimeter of a rectangle? What if the area rectangles involve algebra tiles? Well, we're not talking about that specific question right there because you guys didn't ask about it. Um, but how do you find the area of a rectangle? Base times height. How do you find the perimeter of a rectangle? Add up lengths of sides. Outsides, I should say. Outsides. Find the area and perimeter of the following rectangle. Show it works. So we only had one rectangle. We didn't ask for A. B, the thing about rectangles is that opposite sides are what are called equal or congruent. You'll hear that in geometry next year if you take it. So in other words, if this height is 2, and all these are 2 as well. This is 2. This is 2. If this is 3, this is 3. This is 3. 8, 8, 8, etc. So all this stuff follows through. It's kind of cool. You can use, we can even, um, so if we're going to do area first, what you could do is one of two things. You could either take the area of each individual rectangle, these small ones that are divided up. Like this one is 8 times 3. That's 24. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 2 is 4. And 8 times 2 is 16. And the areas, the, the, the sum of the areas of the small rectangles equals the area of the large rectangle. So the area is 16 plus 4 plus 24 plus 6. 16 plus 4 is 20. 24 plus 6 is 30. 20 plus 30 is 50. So that's 50, and these are square units. 50 units squared, that would be your answer that we're going to get down here. Another way to do this problem, which is probably how most people would do it. Well, actually, you know what? That's not necessarily true. A lot of people might do it this way. But another way that you can do it is find the lengths of the individual sides themselves, like 2 plus 3, that's 5. 8 plus 2, that's 10. Now, if that's 10, this is also 10. Notice how that's 8 plus 2, and this is also 5, that's 2 plus 3. So this will just be 5 times 10, because that's also base times height. So we do the same math, we just do it in a different way. Okay, um, this, is, this, very, this goes very well with the x stuff that we do and all that. You know, this really is 8 plus 2 times 2 plus 3, and you can do all that foiling stuff if you want. These are technically generic rectangles if you want, but we didn't ask for that. <coughs> but perimeter, this, this stuff was good for perimeter. 10 plus 5 plus 10 plus 5. You could also say that's 10 times 2. You have to double your numbers plus 5 times 2. Either way, 20 plus 10 is 30. That's 30 units all around. It's not squared, it's just length. Um, I think that's important to know because you guys didn't ask for the guess and check problem. But the guess and check problem asks for perimeter a lot. Now, perimeter is not just one plus the other. You have to add up all four sides. Maybe it helps to draw a shape if they don't give one to you. So those are your answers. Graphing a parabola. Let's make a table and make a complete graph for this guy right here. So um, when we're doing this, now this one, uh, we did this in class. Like, we didn't do it fully in class. But I did a little bit in class, and I told you this one's not factorable. You can try and factor it, and you'll see that it's not. But OK, so let's say it's not factorable. Let's start and create some points here. Uh, it's not a perfect looking grid, but you know what? We're OK. We're all right. Let me do one more set of lines here. What I'm going to do with my table, I mean, you can make a small table, but I like to make big tables. Uh, not for me, but for you guys for sure. If you don't do the mental math, plug in values for x. Use what you're going to input here to show. Didn't even write it right. Use what you're going to do and show some work. 
find the values for y, and write the coordinate pairs down. For instance, I'll pick some points from negative 3 to 3. That's what I most often do. Well, let's do a 3 way down there. If we happened to find the vertex and happened to find points of symmetry, that would be really cool. We might not find that, though, with this specific one. I'm not sure. I haven't graphed it yet before. The, the only real thing that I want to point out here, because I, because I think you guys know how to plug in points, but it's really with the negatives. Here's a negative 3. And with that negative 3, I'm going to square the number negative 3. So I'm going to use parentheses for that. Now, a lot of you guys like to go in the calculator for this. That's a negative 2. It should be a negative 3. Um, a lot of you guys like to use a calculator for this. I say a calculator can screw you up. Be careful with that. Negative 3 squared, if you type that in a calculator and you don't use parentheses, you're going to get negative 9, and you need positive 9. So that's where, you know, just say this out loud. Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 minus a negative 3 is 9 plus 3. That's 12. 12 plus 2 is 14. One of your points is negative 3, 14. Okay, and that's how you want to keep going through all this. Now, I'm not going to spend time writing down all of these if I do figure out what the pattern is. Negative 2 quantity squared is 4. 4 minus negative 2 is 4 plus 2. That's 6. 6 plus 2 is 8. And that one's 8 there. So that's a negative 2, 8. And this goes so on and so forth. Um, you know what? Maybe I will have to do them all. And that's okay. I just want to save y'all time um, if I feel like we don't need it. I'm just going to keep going down. Look how these keep. This subtracted 6. Now it subtracts 4. Um, quadratics do that weird kind of thing with them. They, they subtract or add like two more than the last time they used and stuff until they hit their vertex. Um, this one is obviously two. Okay, so that's zero, two. That's not necessarily your vertex, though. It's just your y-intercept. Plug in one. Now, the other thing about these is you anticipate this one to be a u-shape. Now, check out this one. This one's at one, two. So, what I'm noticing right here is these have the same height, so the vertex must be right in between them. It's right in the middle. Okay, now there's something, I might not have to do the work on these other ones. Here's, here's a hint for you. If I notice here, um, this went plus 2, then plus 4, then plus 6. This one in between was 0, notice. These are corresponding points. These are CPs. That must mean this next height on this other side must be another plus 2. Okay, if this is something you don't understand, then please don't try and follow along with it and pretend like it makes sense. Make sure you do your graph in your table as you normally would. This one will be plus 4, just like this other one was, because there are corresponding symmetrical points here. Now, the thing is, we never did find the vertex. The vertex is right in the middle of 0 and 1. It's at 0 0.5. Um, don't pretend like that just because you didn't, that you, you know, you're looking for a middle number, you didn't find it, that this thing flattens out or something like that. No, it's still a U-shaped graph. So what I'm going to do with my graph, to make a complete graph here, is I'm going to make x, y axes. Notice these never go negative, so I'm not really going to go in the negative direction. I'm going to, I want to make sure I can hit that 14 point, maybe even find another corresponding point from there. Um, here's another hint about corresponding points. Let's say you did find your vertex and you knew what it was. Maybe you don't have to write these other points. You could just graph them correspondingly. Here's what I mean. Let's start plotting some points like um, I'm going to scale a little differently here. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and 1, 2, 3. And I'm going to scale these every 1 so I can hit that 14, I hope. It looks like I should. I'll be just fine. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Good. I'll be able to hit that height just fine. 16, 17, 18. These are 5, 10, 15, etc. Okay. So, to graph this, uh, obviously you plot the points. Negative 3, 14, negative 2, 8, uh, negative 1, 4, and here we go, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6. Notice how these points, co uh, 3, 3, 6, this is 3, 8, I'm sorry, should have been plus 4 is 8, uh, 3, 8. Notice how they're corresponding points. These two are the same height opposite of each other. These two are the same height opposite of each other. Where there's a line down the middle that would divide, I know I'm going into like chapter 8 material as I'm talking about this, but this is kind of how I want you to know about it, you know, because this is it's all important. There's an axis of symmetry right down the middle here at 0.5, at x equals 0 0.5, and that line reflects these points across from each other. So your vertex is somewhere on that 
on this point. That doesn't mean that your vertex, uh, that doesn't mean that your curve goes down like this though, and then it flattens out and does that. No, there's another point there, and we could find it. They're not asking us to do that. But I'll just go ahead and go straight through. Close enough, at least. You could find the vertex if you want. If you do, it's somewhere around there. It hits down, and it comes back up, and it hits some other points. Obviously, my graph isn't beautiful. I'm using this on a touchpad. It's not great, but it's a graph. Um, to complete this graph, there are arrows. You can't really see this arrow, but there's an arrow on this side. And I also want to call this y-axis and this the x-axis. There's a complete graph. Later, I'm going to use the five-point method, I sure hope. What are good strategies for figuring out the rule? Which x values can help you most? OK. Uh, the, th the reason why I wanted to do this problem, really, is because some people might see this and go back to what we used to do in Chapter 3 is start working around until you find a rule, which is completely fine. You can do that. But these are out of order, right? One thing you can do is you can rearrange these in order, like 0, 1, and 2. And if that's 0, 1, and 2, then this is 2, blank, and 8. And you could start figuring things out that way, which is completely fine, because the idea here is as these add 1 each time, what do these add? You add some number here and some number here to get to 8. Looks like we're adding 3 each time, so this number is 5. And you can do things like that, and you can figure out a rule where this is growth rate and this is starting value and stuff like that. But you are so far removed from that, I hope, these days, that you can recognize that these are points on a, on a line in a graph, where here's an xy value. You have a point 2, 8. You have a point zero two. You have an unknown point. Well, now you know it's 1, 5. But let's say you didn't know that yet. You have a point negative 1, negative 1. You have a point 5, 17. You have a point 4, 14. You have five different points on this graph. One of them, which represents the y-intercept. You can pick any two points on this graph, which we're going to do later. So this is a test for what you're going to do later um, in this video. You can t pick any two points and find the slope. It's all about rise over run. I'll just pick the first two points right here, 2, 8, and 0, 2. If they said write the equation of a line that passes through the points 0, 2, and 2, 8, that's exactly what this thing is asking you as well. And then it's asking you, what is y when x equals 1? What is y when x equals all these? And we'll figure them out. So what we got to do is we got to find, we're going to write this in this form. I got to find a slope. I already know what the y-intercept is. It's 2, 0, 2. I gotta find the slope though. So I gotta find the change in my y values. How much did I rise from two to eight? You do eight minus two. How much did I run from zero to two? You do two minus zero. That's six over two, which is three, or three over one. So your equation is y equals three x plus two. Um, we're gonna do more y-intercept practice later because I already see what it is, I'm good with it. So to figure out all the other ones, this one is gonna be three times one plus two. That is 5, as you well know. You start from 2, you add 3 each time. 1.5, you do 3 times 1.5 plus 2. I think that's 6.5. 6.5. This is 3 times negative 7 plus 2. That's negative 19. This is 3 times 100 plus 2. That's 302. And this is 3 times k plus 2, which is 3k plus 2, just like your equation. This is the general form. When we started this last semester, this is kind of how they looked. This is how we were doing our problems. And now you're so well versed with this. You've been doing so much and you've learned graphs that don't go into prehistoric times of things if you have learned something new since then. Okay, showing linear growth. I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. And you know what? This is the same equation. That's, I, didn't, I don't know if that was intentional. I have no idea. Um, but I'm going to go through this quickly because it has a lot of different things for it. I'm going to start with the equation, 3x plus 2. Our slope is 3, grow by, starting value is 2. We could use this, our starting value, and we could add 3 each time. That'll keep increasing it. Well, 1 1.1 is 5, 8, 11. We can subtract to go this way. That's negative 1 and negative 4. Uh, the x-intercept... We'll start with the y-intercept, 0, 2. We already know that one. It's the value of y when x equals 0. So to solve that, you would have done y equals 3 times 0 plus 2. is y equals 0 plus 2, y equals 2. That's easy enough. And it's always that value in y equals mx plus b form. That's always your y-intercept. Your x-intercept is the value of x when y equals 0. So it's at the point x comma 0. Here's x, here's y. So we can substitute 0 for y, 
and it's not so obvious, you have to do a little bit more work. Subtract 2, and then divide by 3. x will equal negative 2 thirds. So this point is negative 2 thirds comma 0, and I'd rather you write it as a fraction than a decimal, so you have the exact point. Um, this graph is increasing every time you go up three, you're going over, uh, every time you go over one, you're going up three, you're rising. Let's go ahead and graph this, and to graph this guy right here, um, here's how we've been graphing. We start at the y-intercept, this is y equals 3x plus 2. Remember in this, uh, here, let me write this one more time, y equals 3 over 1x plus 2, if that helps, because your slope is up three over one. We rise three, we run one. And if that doesn't help, look, you do have a few of these points right here, you can plot them. But this is how we've practiced it, up 3 over 1, and you keep going. If you want to go this way, you go down 3 over 1, down 3 over 1, and keep going. And obviously, we can keep going. Uh, if you have a ruler, or I have this very nice tool, where I can go bump, 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 and I can just say, hey, there's my graph. It's beautiful. Now look at the, uh, so here's your y-intercept. It's the value of y when x equals 0. This right here is your x-intercept. Look at that point. I'm going to erase this little red part. Look at that point. It's at about negative, or it should be, it's at negative 2 thirds comma 0. It's the value of x when y equals 0. And that's where it's crossing the x-axis. And that's what that graph there means. Here, which figure number will have 38 tiles in it? Um, the tiles, uh, if you remember, the, the figure number represents your x, so when x equals 0, when x equals 1, when x equals 2. And we're going to draw some tiles here. Um, which figure number will have 38 tiles in it? That's 38 tiles is y, so you substitute 38 for y and you solve for x to find out what figure number it is. Subtract 2, divide by 3. You'll get x equals 36 over 3, which is 12. So figure number 12 will have 38 tiles in it. Now let me zoom out a little bit for this problem so you can kind of see this as a whole. I know that it might be a little overwhelming to not... Well, there you go. That's a little too zoomed out. Go 100%. Um, so last part is just these tiles. Look, you can draw tiles however you'd like. I think the one I did in class... I'll do the same one. The one I did in class was like figure 0 has two tiles in it. So let's say you start with any two tiles like these two guys right here. Okay. Now when you draw other figures, that's cool. Keep those two tiles and whatever you do with them, like if I paste these in right here, I want you to keep adding other sets of three tiles. So I think what I did was I made an L shape up here and I stacked it on top of that previous tile right there. That way you can watch a pattern grow. So those are those three tiles right there. Maybe you copy and you paste that when you add this other one in. So I take figure one, I add three more tiles, and voila, that's figure two. So notice how it keeps that same pattern growth. Figure three would take that same set, and it would add another set of tiles. So it would look like that, plus these guys right here. So you could figure out the pattern pretty quickly if you saw it, if you gave this to somebody else. Notice that would have been figure three that would have had 11 tiles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And they just, it keeps going that way. And that's how you had fun with these web designs. They weren't that bad. They, before they used to look overwhelming because you're like, where do I begin? And now you kind of know everything about them. Let's move on. Okay, finding the intersection point of two linear equations. The uh, people, the only people who, the, the person who asked about this problem only wanted to see this in table form. They didn't want to ask about the equation with equal values method where you set these two equal to each other and solve for x and plug them in and solve for y. They also didn't want to see the graph where you graph these two and find where they intersect. They said, what does it mean on a table? And here is what it means on a table. What it means is I could make a table where I'm plugging in values for x and getting values out for y. Now, the only thing here, though, is that you have two different y values. You have two different equations. right? You really should call these two different y values. One I could call like y1, y sub 1 and the other y sub 2. That way, when I plug in values for x, I can figure out what y sub 1 values are and y sub 2 values are. It would help if I did graph this to show you exactly what I was talking about, but basically there are two different sets of x, y points. There will be x, y points for this equation, and there will be x, y points for this equation. When I find a solution to them, and I'm just going to pick some points, 
I believe I, hey, you know what, actually, I think I remember what the answer is. But when I start picking some points, I'm going to pick them until I find when the y values are the same. Obviously, the x values are the same, because I'm choosing the same x values. But which x, y pair is the same for both equations? Remember, it's where the two lines intersect. If this is one line and this is the other line, boom, what is that x, y value that's the same? Because these are different x, y values here than are here. So we plug in values for x into both equations. Plug in negative 2. 3 times the negative 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 minus 2 is negative 8. Here, negative 2 plus 4 is 2. Not the same. Try it again. Negative 1. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. Minus 2 is negative 5. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. Not the same. Moving on. 3 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 0 plus 4 is 4. Still not the same. Um, and if you don't want to do it like by plugging it in, obviously notice that here, when you're doing it on the top equation, you're adding 3 each time. Okay, If you want to use it like a table like that, that's fine. Here, you're obviously adding 1 each time. Remember, your slope over here is 1. So this is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Here, negative 8, negative 5, negative 2, positive 1, positive 4, positive 7. Aha! We found our solution. 3, 7. Notice how 3, 7 is a point of intersection for both graphs. Let's say that point was 3, 7. So this is where these two intersect, and this is how you found it in a table. Substitute values for uh, substitute x, values for x to get different values for y. When are the y values the same? This is when you have like a word problem, something like the population. I, I mean, we've had a lot of word problems, just not in a long time. The population of these two cities are... This is the starting value of this one. It's increasing by this much, and the other one has this thing, all that. And a lot of different equations we've done. But for the sake of time, let's keep going on. Okay, solve for x. Um, I'll do it two different ways for you. I'll do it through straight distribution, and if you don't know how to do the straight distribution, I'll use generic rectangles. Straight distribution here, I'm going to do 3 times x plus 3 times negative 4. That's minus 12. Then the plus 2 equals x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. x times 1 is positive 1x. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. You would start from there. Um, the other way that you do this is if you didn't know how to distribute, you could always use generic rectangles. Let's say for the first one right here, I have a base of, or I have a height of 3 and a base of x minus 4. 3 times x minus 4. That's 3 times x, 3 times negative 4. Obviously, that's the same thing as this. It's just, you know, people have different perceptions of things, and they need this, and that's completely fine. There's no problem with that. Uh, now you build another generic rectangle, which is probably more useful for most of y'all. x uh, plus 1 times x minus 3. x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. x times 1 is 1x. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And you can once again see where this is coming into form. So there's no problem using generic rectangles. If you need that perception, go with it. Eventually, over time, I recommend you try and find a way to know how to foil. Some people do it in their head, and that's great. Keep on with what you do. Just don't <laughs> be wrong. Now we've got to do some simplification. Negative 12 plus 2 is negative 10. So I have 3x minus 10 on this side. On this side, I have x squared. Negative 3x plus 1x is negative 2x, and then a minus 3. Okay, this one is a quadratic formula. Um, we have to solve this equation here. We have to solve for x, and this is in quadratic form. I'm going to move these to the, this side of the equation. I have to subtract 3x, and I have to add 10, and I have to make sure that I combine proper like terms when I do it. So these go away, and these get added over. Now I'm going to have x squared minus 5x plus 7 equals 0. This is a great problem, uh, not necessarily for chapters 1 through 5. I'm surprised they gave it to you. But this one we're going to use quadratic formula for. I can already tell you right now it's not factorable. To save us time, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that right now. This is not factorable. If you're going to use quadratic formula, you need to know what your a, b, and c values are. I know that this is kind of out of practice for this stuff. I still don't know why this problem is here, right here, because you guys wouldn't have known how to solve it at this point. We would use quadratic formula to solve this. OK, 
Okay, to do that, I like to start in the discriminant first and figure out what b squared minus 4ac is first, because in case this has no solution, I want to be prepared for that. So this becomes b squared minus 4ac, which is 25 minus 28, which is negative 3. <gasps> Here you see b squared minus 4ac is a negative number. You can't take the square root of a negative number and get a real solution. So your solution here is no real solutions. Your final answer is that. In um, Algebra 3-4, you're going to learn something called imaginary numbers. And yes, that is an actual concept. They are actually called imaginary numbers. And you will find out solutions to these things with negative square roots, square roots of negative numbers. Um, but this one right here, this had a lot of work for so very little output. There is no real solution there. There's a lot of work done, and we will do more quadratic formulas down the line. Solve for y. Now the thing with where this says, when the directions say solve for smiley face, what your final answer will look like? Well, if you had an equation with a smiley face in it, or a lot of them, your final answer should be smiley face equals blah, 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 blah. So when this says solve for y, and you're like, how do I solve for y? It has x's in it. Well, yeah, you know, it has x's in it. That doesn't mean your y equation won't have x in the equation. It's like if, eh, that, I won't give that example. I was going to say something about definition and vocab words. So solve for y, just get y by itself. I'm, I want to move, you know, simplify, isolate, divide. Let's move the y's over to the left side of the equation, sure. And if I'm going to do that and isolate it, then I have to move this 3x over to this side of the equation. Now, it doesn't combine with negative 8. 6y minus 2y is 4y. Negative 3x is on this side. Negative 8 is also on this side. They do not combine. Now I have to do my dividing step, which is dividing by 4. And when I divide by 4, I've got to divide it by every term, and it's probably more beneficial to do it this way because you're going to be writing a lot of equations in slope-intercept form. This is just one of them. So your final equation is y equals negative 3 fourths x minus 2. There's no problem to solve for y in that thing like that. We're going to graph a lot of problems like that using equations like this. That's, that's good. I want you to be able to know how to do that and practice that. Okay, last two in here were proportions before we move on to chapter 6 through 10. Um, What's the most important once, what is the most important, maybe what is the most important step? When setting up a, a proportion from a word problem, uh, that the units line up. That's going to be for part B. Units line up. And you'll see what that means. Let's do the first one. Um, you, you learned what cross multiplication is, so I'm just going to say it straight up. For the amount of time we have in this, which is not very much, I, it, which is quite, you know, we're, we're going to be using up quite a lot of time. I just want to move you straight ahead. If you have fractions, get rid of these guys you can by cross multiplying. Uh, just make sure when you do, you multiply 10 by both x and negative 2. So you get 6 times 3 to be 18. And this multiply, distribute 10 times x, 10 times negative 2, you're going to get 10x minus 20. It's simplified. Now we've got to isolate. I'm going to add 20 to both sides. And I get 38 is 10x. Divide both sides by 10. Dividing step, you'll get x is 38 over 10. Or that can reduce to um, 19 over 5. Or this is also 3.8 as an exact decimal. What that means is if you substituted x into this equation, whatever that number is, that's the same as 3 over 10. 1.8 divided by 6 apparently is the same as 0.3 because that's what 3 over 10 is. Okay, So that's the only x value that makes this true in the original equation. That's what happens when you substitute it. Check it out. Um, what is the most important step when setting a, pro a proportion? You've got to line up your units. So in this one, they ask you if it takes 4 cups of flour to make 35 cookies. That's like a rate. You can make 35 cookies. Yeah, this is a ratio using every per four cups of flour or whatever. If I set up a proportion, I'm going to make an equation out of this ratio and another ratio. How many cups of flour? That's what we're trying to solve. What is our x? Hey, 35 and 4. Now we're going to make a ratio here using another rate. How many cups of flour does it take to make 100 cookies? So here we're going to have 100 cookies. Notice how cookies have to line up with these cookies on top. Cookies, cookies. Cookies wouldn't be down here if I'm trying to make a proportion out of it. And this is going to be x cups of flour. 
So we have to now solve for what this unknown x is right here. If we want to keep this rate, by the way, 35 divided by 4 is 8.75. You can make 8.75 cookies per cup of flour, right? So I'm making 8.75 cookies per cup of flour. Um, if I keep that rate up, how many cups of flour does it take to make 100 is the question. So I'm just going to use that proportion. 35 over 4 equals 100 over x. I'm going to cross multiply, just like we did last time. I'll do 35 times x equals, that'll be 100, uh, 100 times 4. 35x equals 400. Divide both sides by 35. You'll get x equals 400 over 35. That number is about... Let me grab my calculator. Whoa, it's, it's, it's kind of a weird number. It's approximately, squiggly lines means approximated, rounded, 11 point, I'll just do 11.4. It's about 11.4 cups of flour. You get a little more, you get about 11 and a half cups of flour, you'll be able to make 100 cookies, at least with this rate. So let's say that you are, like, you know, like let's say that you have the recipe, and the recipe is for 35 cookies, right? Because... Sometimes they use a standard base. And they're like, all right, it takes four cups of flour. And you know that at your party you want to make 100 cookies. This is the rate you'd set up. You're like, gentlemen, buy 12 cups of flour for me. I know I'm going to need that much. I'm going to screw up a little bit. I want to have some left over. I want to have more cookies. If you want to make at least 100 cookies, you need at least 11.4 cups of flour. Okay, I'm going to move on to the new to the stuff uh, from the other packets. So these are uh, starting from Chapter 6. And I realize that this is going to be a kind of a longer video, so I'm going to go ahead and keep speaking. Word problems. This is why word problems is so important to define your variables and say them as specific as you possibly can. N equals the number of nickels. I pointed out to some people in class, these are coins. How many coins there are? It's not the value. Same with D being the number of dimes and Q being the number of quarters. These are also your coins. So you have to make sure that when you have mathematical statements right here, the sentences, and you want to make it into a proper English sentence, that y you can say this out loud. Like I can say, I can literally substitute the number of dimes for D. The number of if dimes plus the number of quarters equals 35. A better way to say that really, if you want a true English sentence that's a little more like these ones, you know, like, like equals 35 what? That's, that's an important thing. Is it 35 cents? No. A better way for me to say this is the total number of dimes and quarters that Lorraine has. Or, or, well, here, how about this? Lorraine has 35 coins. 35 total coins of which, now I'm getting too fancy, of which are dimes and quarters. The point is that I wanted to say everything in a pure, you know, like in a true sentence um, that talks about the subject, that talks about what she has, what the units are, and how these things break up. These are the number of dimes and quarters. She has 35 total quarters. Now, I don't know how many of which she has. Let's say you had another equation. This is quarters and nickels. We want to make another statement here. And it might help to look at how some of the other sentences are working out right here. This is about her number of quarters. The number of quarters that Lorraine has is, now is is the same as equals, is equal to, now I'm going to write this out and then I'll see if I can explain it. It's five more than triple her number of nickels. How do you spell nickels like that? Um, okay, it's a little out of sequence and a little out of whack, but these other ones will help you for it when we say them. I have a certain number of nickels. I am going to triple that number. Then I'm going to add 5 to it. When I add 5 to it, that means I have 5 more than I had before. Okay, so even though this is set, set out of sequence, 
I don't want you to just say the number of quarters is equal to three times the number of nickels plus five. Because when you have these sentences, how are you going to make the mathematical statements? I want to make sure that you're well aware of which ways they go. Five more then can be added afterward. That's fine in the mathematical statement. And is can be equal. Um, just make sure that you kind of have that basis. You, you've seen a few of these. Okay, I want to make sure that, that you're well versed in it because now we're going in this one. Lorraine has five more dimes than she has quarters. If you have these kinds of sentences, first of all, I want you to be able to define these. Secondly, I want you to be able to use real numbers to help yourself out. I always give you this recommendation. I'm giving it to you one last time unless we have more word problems. Use real numbers to help you out. What if Lorraine had 15 dimes? If she has five more dimes than she has quarters, how many quarters does she have? And you say, oh, she has 10. And I say, how did you know that? And you might give me some math. You'll say, because 10 plus 5, or because 15 minus 5. Perfect. That's perfect. Now, 15 was a random number, right? She doesn't really have 15 dimes. She might. But she, we don't know how many dimes she has. She has D dimes, right? She really has D dimes and Q quarters. She has the number of times she has is D, number of quarters she has is Q. So use those numbers. What did you do? You did 15 minus 5, or 10 plus 5, or whichever you did here. So if you're going to do this here, you can write D minus 5 is Q, or you can write Q, darn it, D minus 5 is Q, or Q plus 5 equals D. Either way, this says the number of dimes minus 5. If I take away 5 dimes from what I have, I'll get quarters. If I add five quarters to what I have, I'll get dimes. Lorraine has five more dimes than she has quarters. This, these, both these statements are perfectly fine. Okay, the next one, the number of dimes is 10 less than twice the number of nickels. Like, ooh, like there's a lot there to say. Number of dimes is D, 10 less than. Now notice how this one said five more than. Notice how we did plus five after the three N. 10 less than something is taking your something and then taking 10 away from it. So the number of dimes is 10 less than twice the number of nickels. Twice is two times. So there's the equation, actually. That one is D equals 2N minus 10. Last one, the total amount of money in her jar is 23.45. This is the first one that doesn't have to do with coinage, but rather the value of each one. So this is, once again, where real numbers might help. Let's say you had two nickels. How much money do you have? And you go, 10. And I say, how do you know? You're like, you did 5 plus 5. OK, what if you had 50 nickels? Are you going to add 5 50 times? Sure, you might. But you also just might do 50 times 5. And that number is 250. You say, you have 250 cents or $2.50. Now, that's important that I'm writing that. I'm going to keep this up here for a very good reason in this problem. Either 250 cents, let me do the um, symbol, or $2.50, dollars, right? Because these are different units, 250 versus 2.5. Um, now, what did you do? You took the number of nickels that you had. Okay, this is once again where the variables kick in. The number of nickels we know is n. You multiplied that by the value of each nickel. That's 5. So if you want to figure out how much money she has from her nickels, you take the value of each nickel which is 5, multiply it by the number of nickels that she has. This number will give you how much money she has in nickels. Literally, it's going to be how many cents she has in nickels. You can do the same thing for dimes. What if you had 4 dimes? That's 40 cents. What did you do? You did 10 times the number of dimes, 10D. You can do the same thing for quarters. 25 times the number of quarters gives you how much money you have in quarters. That equals tw uh, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, this is where people are going to get confused. Everybody does it. You have to be very careful. When I multiply 5 times the number of nickels, like let's say she had 5 nickels, that would be 25 cents, right? 5 times 5 is 25, not 0.25. If you want your number to be in dollars, you have to make sure you use decimals appropriately. Then the difference between the number 250 and 250, like 2.5, like 
is about 250, right? That is a huge difference. There's a big difference in these numbers and you have to make sure you account for the decimal. So either you can keep the units like this as cents, cents, where everything's in terms of cents, or you can convert it to dollars. And if you convert it to dollars, make sure that everything is in terms of dollars, such as not just the 2345, because $23.45 is really $23.45, right? Now, if I do these, I also have to give two decimal places over for everything. It's going to go there, like 0.25 Q. Okay. It's also going to go here. Let me erase that top thing because that's going to confuse you. It's also going to go two decimal places over from here to 0 0.10D. You don't even have to put the zero. This one, though, it's going to go two decimal places over. It's not 0 0.5. That's 50 cents. It's going to be 0 0.05. That's that one right there. You add all those up, and this will be your equation. So you can do either equation, but if you do it differently, it'll be wrong. Either one is correct. If you mesh them in different ways, you would be incorrect. So be very, very careful of that. Units are going to mess up a lot of people. Okay, number three, let's solve each system of equations using either the equal values method, the substitution method, or the elimination method. Um, now, keep in mind, substitution and equal values are the same thing, in that equal values is a specific form of substitution method. I'm going to do, for the first one, I'll do elimination and substitution. I'll show you two different ways, because this one's like a combination of equal values and substitution. Um, first one I'll do here is elimination method. I know that that was kind of the last one that we learned, but this one's the most set up for it. Elimination me uh, method is all about eliminating one of your variables if you add down these columns by combining like terms. And if you do, then you can solve for your other variable. But you can't do it unless you have the opposite of the value assigned. So if I multiply, I can eliminate x pretty easily here. If I multiply both sides by negative 3, I'm going to get 5y plus 3x equals negative 3 for the top equation. That's just this one right here. And down here for this equation, it'll be negative 9y minus 3x equals negative 9. Notice what I was able to achieve. I was able to, now, now when I add down on top and bottom, and we've done this a couple of times, I've explained why before. If you'd like to see why again, go back to a previous video, why we can do this, but you can only do it when they're actually lined up, including the equal signs. 3x minus 3x is 0. 5y minus 9y is negative 4y. Negative 3 minus 9 is negative 12. And then we can divide both sides by negative 4, and we'll get y equals 3. Now we're not done with the problem for a couple things. <laughs> Remember, system solving the system means finding where the points intersect. And to do that, you need an x value and a y value. And you need to write it as an ordered pair. So to solve for x, substitute 3 into either equation for y. I'll just use this bottom. You can use this one too. But I'll just use this bottom equation. It's cleaner numbers, no negatives. x might be a negative number, and it looks like it will be. We'll get 9 plus x equals 3. Subtract 9, we'll get x equals negative 6. So your final solution to this is negative 6, comma 3. That is the point where these two graphs intersect if we were able to graph them. And they're both straight lines. Now, how about substitution method? Um, substitution method wouldn't be a great one unless you could get one variable by itself. So let me rewrite this equation here as 5y plus 3x equals negative 3, and then this one is 3y plus x equals 3. I'm rewriting them, and what I'm going to do is the easiest one for me to solve for without any fraction issues is if I get this x all by itself in this equation. What if I subtract 3y over to both sides in this equation? I would get x equals 3 minus 3y. The whole idea of substitution is if you have an x equals in one equation, you can take what this part is right here, substitute it for x into the other equation, like this one, 3 minus 3y, and start solving for y. 5y plus 3 times 3 minus 3y. This is x, right? If x equals this, you're substituting that for x. That equals negative 3. Now I can distribute. That's 9 minus 9y equals negative 3. 
5y minus 9y is negative 4y. Negative 4y, if you subtract 9, equals negative 12, and y equals 3. You can once again see where you get your solution. Obviously, it looks like there was a little more work that you had to do for this problem for substitution. Looks like it was set up a little more for elimination. But look, sometimes it's not as set up for elimination, and sometimes people don't like to use elimination. Maybe you still don't know how to do it. Go ahead and use substitution. It's very possible, but sometimes it's easier than other times. And in this particular chance, you really, uh, instance, you needed to have a chance to get a variable by itself without fractions. That's going to help you out the most. Okay, part B, <coughs> I'm going to use literally just, this is equal values method in a nutshell. But equal values method is substitution method. Check this out. Substitute x plus 5 in for y over here because y equals x plus 5. So this will be 3x minus 1 equals x plus 5. And that's the same thing as equal values method. If y equals this, and y equals that, then this equals that. So you just solve for x, subtract x to both sides here. You know, sometimes I'm not going to write those middle steps, like how did this become 2x? So I subtracted x. Here I added 1, and x equals 3. Substitute 3 into either equation. I'll use the top one. It looks a little bit easier. y equals 3 plus 5, and that equals 8. And your final solution is 3, 8. That is your ordered pair. I'm not going to do elimination for that one. Okay, set up and solve a system of equations for the problem below. Be sure to clearly define your variables. Clearly. Not only define them, do it clearly. So, two bagels, bagels, two bagels and one glass of milk cost $2.45. Yeah, there are decimals. That's okay. Four bagels and three glasses of milk cost $5.55. How much does one bagel cost? How much does one glass of milk cost? So, these are the things that we don't know. If we don't know them, they must be our unknowns. And if they are unknowns, they are variables. Those are the things we are going to define. I'm going to set b equal to, watch this, it will not be, here, I'll just do it again. Um, b will not equal what a lot of people would put in this step. Please don't do this. b is not equal to bagels. Because what could bagels mean? It could be how many bagels there are. It could be the weight of the bagels. It could be how much they cost. It could be a lot, at least those three things. I think those are the primary ones. In this case, it's not equal to bagels. It's equal to the cost of one bagel. That's what we're trying to solve for. How much does one bagel cost? This way we know that our answer will be in dollars. Or it could be in cents, but you have to make sure that you know which. This is going to be another um, unit issue. And I'm going to do M for cost of one glass of, not for one milk, <laughs> one glass of milk. That will also be in dollars. And we have to solve for both of them. And when you solve for them in word problems, please answer the question as a complete sentence. Okay. Uh, write and solve a system of equations. So this is one of those ones where we, you, you, just like the quarter one we did as far as value, maybe use real numbers as an example. If, if, for example, bagels cost 50 cents each, I don't know if that's the answer, but if bagels cost 50 cents each, how are you finding the value of multiple bagels? Let's say three bagels. You would do three times the number of bagels, right? So that'd be 3B. So whenever we're doing these things, two bagels, two times the cost of each bagel gives you how much money you're spending on your bagels, right? If Two bagels are 50 cents, then or if, if one bagel is 50 cents, two bagels are one dollar. That's what you did there. Plus one glass of milk, one M. This, now, this doesn't say one glass of milk. This says how much money you're spending on one glass of milk. That's why when we get equals 2.45, we made sure that our units lined up. And I can't stress this enough. This is dollars plus dollars equals dollars. You can only do that if the units are the same. They can't be different kinds of units. Now these other units in this word problem also are the same. Only they're, only it's another variation. Someone buys another set. This is how much they spent on four bagels. This is how much they spent on three glasses of milk. This is how much they spent total. Um, this is how much they spent total. Once again, dollars plus dollars equals dollars. And then you solve. Now to solve it, I'm going to go ahead with elimination method. It's very lined up. 
Looks like I can multiply this top equation by either negative 2 to cancel out my b's or negative 3 to cancel out my m's. I'll go and do negative 2 um, only because it looks like I'll get more positive numbers and it's that forefront value. So if I multiply everything by negative 2, down here I'm going to get negative 4b minus 2m equals negative $4.90. And when you subtract, or when you add, and they, these guys subtract, you'll get 1m equals 0.65. Okay. Now to solve for b, let's go and plug it into, I guess, that first equation. Let's get 2b plus 0.65, that's 1m, equals 2.45. 2b, subtract 0.65, you'll get 1.80, and divide, you'll get b equals 0 0.90, or 0 0.9. But if you're writing this as dollars, you will say, as your final answer, one bagel costs that. Now, what are the units? Because here's the problem. A lot of people would say this, and I want someone to tell me right now what's wrong. Ignore those emails. Um, what is going to be wrong with what I say here. Costs uh, 0.65 cents. The issue with this is that 0.65 cents is literally 65% of a cent. We need to take 65% of a dollar. If you want to put 0.65 dollars, that's fine. If you want to put 65 cents, that's fine. But you want to put 0.65 cents. You put 0.65 dollars or like that. You know, like that. By the way, Calvin's my dad. That's why uh, it says Calvin on there. I should change the name now, obviously. Um, you can put it like this. This is probably the best one to do because it's closest to your answer. You're using units with symbols. And that's, it makes sense to us. We see it like that. But if you put 0.90 cents, that's literally a fraction of a penny. You don't want that to be your answer. But you do need to answer the question. And answering it, we had to, um, we had to write out sentences. And we had to leave units. Okay, I, I do feel like I was slowing down a little bit, so I, I want to speed up. I feel like I'm teaching again too much. Chapter 7, I just want to answer these ones quickly. I, w I wanted you to have these for you. Line 4 is positive slope. Line 2 is a negative slope. Line, I was going to put 0. Line 1 is a slope of 0, and line 3 is undefined slope. Positive, as you run, you're rising. Negative, as you run, you're falling. Zero, as you run, you don't rise or run. That's zero over delta x, which is zero. That's why it has a slope of zero. This one, you don't run at all as you rise. That is delta y over zero, which is undefined. Cannot divide by zero. That's where I'll do one of my red x's. So there you go, undefined slope. Hang on, i got to take a sip of water. All right, so as we've done graphs all our lives, I wanted to skip problems where we graph one instead of look at ones that has a graph, especially because this one has some tricky stuff in it. What are the coordinates of the x and y intercepts? x intercepts, as these go every, they show you the scale, these go every two. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. So when y is zero, x is six. y intercept, negative one, negative two. But oh, be careful, your scale is two. So this is negative 2, negative 4. There were only, I honestly, there were only a handful. Like I could count on my hand how many people actually got that right. That's hard, right? Because you've you got to look at that scale. It's not always the same as your x's, but your y's have to be consistent. What is the slope of the line? Still be careful because this is not going up 1 over 3 or something like that. This is going up 2 over 3. Check this out. As I run 3 this way, if I run from point to point, that's running 3. How much is that rise? It's 2. It's not 1, because I'm going from negative 4 to negative 2. So the slope is 2 thirds. So the equation of the line in y equals mx plus b form is y equals 2 thirds x minus 4. As your y-intercept, your b value is negative 4. This was m. Okay, number 10. Josh believes that the lines y equals negative 2x plus 7 and 6x plus 3y equals 9 are parallel. Is he correct? Clearly explain. Okay, parallel lines mean same slope and also different y-intercept. If they had the same y-intercept, they'd be the same exact line because m and b would be the same. If I had two lines that were y equals 2 thirds x minus 4 and y equals 2 thirds x minus 4, they'd be the exact same line. 
Now, you guys took a test where you had this problem, and when you did, a lot of people said no, because one is the slope of negative 2, one is the slope of 6. You would be right if this was in y equals mx plus b form. This one's in y equals mx plus b form. We're good. The other one, however, is not. This one we have to solve for y, get y by itself. Remember earlier in the video when I said you might have to do this. Subtract 6x. Divide both sides by 3. Negative 6 divided by 3 is negative 2. 9 divided by 3 is 3. So notice how this equation here, underneath this equation, these are my two lines. They both have the same m value of negative 2. They have the same slope. They have different light y-intercepts. Josh's belief is correct. Josh's belief is correct that both lines are parallel because they have the same slope. Check y equals mx plus b form. That's super important that you use that form to figure that out. That was really the, that's really the only way that I can see that and look at that unless I graph it myself using a table. But I'd probably get into that form first even if I did that. Okay, uh, 12 is where time could, there could be a lot of time spent on this. I'm going to try and go as quickly as possible. Uh, like meaning I'm not going to spend time coaching these things. Everything's going to get in y equals mx plus b form. In order to do this, we need, like for all these equations, we need m and b. That's it. We have a slope on this one. So now all we need is y-intercept. To do that, you have to figure out what b is. In order to do that, you need some sort of point, like this xy value right here. This x value can plug in for, uh, you can plug in 8 for x over here. You can plug in 5 for y over there. So I'll go ahead and do that. We'll get 5 equals negative 3 halves times 8. By the way, 8 is 8 over 1, if that helps you multiply fractions a little better. Negative 3 times 8 is negative 24. Negative 24 over 8, uh, sorry, negative 24 over 2 is negative 12. So 5 equals negative 12 plus b. So b equals positive 17 if you add 12 to both sides. So your final equation is y equals negative 3 halves x plus 17. Use your slope and your y-intercept that you were given, and that crosses through the point 8, 5. Next one, find the line that passes through the points 4, 12, and 0, 4. Now, now you still need slope and y-intercept, so we need to find out what m is. Now, m is rise over run. How much do you rise? from 4 to 12. You do 12, right? This, if this is x, y, and this is also x, y, you got to do one y value minus the other and one x value minus the other. How much do you run from 0 to 4? You do 4 minus 0. So that point, or that slope here, is 8 over 4, which is 2 over 1, or 2. Okay. Um, moving on from there, so that equation is now y equals 2x plus b. To solve for b, you could substitute this for x, this for y, and find it just like we did here, or this for x, this for y. You have multiple points to choose from because you have both of them. But if you know anything about y-intercepts, it's the value of y when x equals 0. So your b value is 4. It's the value, b is 4. It's the value of y when x equals 0. So b is 4, so your equation is going to be y equals 2x plus 4. And you would have gotten 4 if you did the same thing, plugging in that for x, y, or that for x, y. Number C. <laughs> Number C. Letter C. We've got to find the line that is parallel to this line, y equals 3x plus 1, and it goes through this point. So what we need, once again, are slope and y-intercept. If it's parallel to the line, that means it needs to have a slope of 3. So your slope is going to be 3. So the equation is going to be y equals 3x plus b. Still need to find a y-intercept. Use the point that you were given. Substitute negative 1 for x and 5 for y. Get 5 equals 3 times 1, oh, negative 1, plus b. So 5 equals negative 3 plus b. So b equals 8. So your equation is y equals uh, 3x plus and I do realize I'm going through quickly, but these are problems that we have done before. This is a YouTube video that you can pause, and I assume you've already done most of this stuff, and you're just writing it down alongside it. So I'm okay with continually talking. Look, we're running long in this video, man. We're only in chapter, well, we're in chapter 7. Um, the line is horizontal. Now, horizontal, this is why I wanted to do this thing. Horizontal, that is horizontal. This here is vertical. 
Horizontal has a slope of 0. So the line is horizontal. Kind of tricky. M equals 0 and passes through the point to negative 4. Um, that's why they said graph it if you need to. Then you could do that horizontal line. But also passing through the point to negative 4. That's okay. We got y equals 0x plus b. Now look. Um, y equals 0x plus b. You might as well put y equals 0 plus b. You might as well put y equals b. 0 times x is 0. 0 plus b is b. So your equation is going to be y equals whatever the y-intercept is. This is also why they ask you to maybe graph it if you want to try. What if you graphed this where you have the point 2, negative 4 right here. Okay, And then you want to draw a horizontal line through it. What is the y-intercept of this line? Where is it crossing through the y-axis? Well, that wasn't perfect. I'm going to move it. Well, if it passes through the point 2, negative 4, and no matter what x is, right? It doesn't matter what x is. You're always going to multiply it by 0. No matter what x is, y is negative 4, then your equation literally is y equals negative 4. Your y-intercept right there is 0, negative 4. So b equals negative 4. Therefore, y equals negative 4. If you write your equation as y equals 0x minus 4, that's fine. I don't care. You won't get marked down. But if this was a multiple choice test, or if you had to do something with this equation and graph it, you want to know what this graph looks like, and the equation is started off like that, make sure you know how to change from one to the other. It's important that you know both. Okay, last chapter, chapter eight. This is a more challenging problem, and I'm not expecting you to fully be able to do this. I, you know, I mean, I sort of am. The reason why I'm doing it is because I'm not doing a full five-point method problem, at least not yet. Um, there is possibly a vertex. There might be other points, even a y-intercept. But these are the two points that are highlighted. And what we're going to do with this is, uh, unfortunately, here, you know what? I might do this problem. If you don't mind, I want to do 16 second. I want to do 19 first, because I want to solve for these first and show you how I'm going to work backwards from here upward. Um, as I do a factoring problem. So I'm going to solve some equations and show some work. Oh, I better show work. Um, I'm going to first see if this problem is factorable. And by factoring, it means that you, uh, you can do a generic rectangle and a diamond if you want. Obviously, some people know how to do it mentally. But if you do, you maybe aren't watching this video and it's not for you. For those who don't, maybe you're still doing it in this method. That's fine. You do this, you're t you have two numbers that are going to add to negative 3, but they're also going to multiply to 1 times negative 18. These two numbers multiplied together is equal to these two numbers multiplied together. If you're trying to find those numbers, you have to make sure you do this product. Uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 18 and add to negative 3 are negative 6 and positive 3. So your breakdown of negative 3x is negative 6x plus 3x. That's what that becomes. That's why we're going to break it down here. We're going to find those factors of that. So we're going to go from the inside out. So we have x and x multiplying to x squared. x times negative 6x is, or x times negative 6 is negative 6x. X. x times 3 is 3x, and 3 times negative 6 is negative 18. So your factoring of this is x plus 3 times x minus 6 equals 0. Now, um, we're not done with the problem. You didn't finish this. To solve this, we have to figure out what values for x gives you this, I guess, this y value or this right side of 0. Uh, we learned something called the zero product property. Let me just write it. And it means if you multiply any two numbers and your answer is 0, then one of your two numbers must be 0. If a times b equals 0, then a equals 0, or b equals 0. What that means for us is we had a quadratic equation before where it was very hard to solve for x unless we factored or did guess and check. But there might be multiple answers. Um, so here we have a product of two, of two values, two quantities, like your a and your b. If I multiply this by this, I get 0. The only way I can get 0 is if I have a value for x that makes x plus 3 equal to 0 or that makes x minus 6 equal to 0. If a times b equals 0, either a does or b does. So what does x have to equal in this case? Either negative 3 or 6. And those are the two values of x that will make this side equal to 0. Check that. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. 0 times anything is 0, so you're good. 
or this, 6 minus 6 is 0, 0 times anything is 0. It doesn't matter that this number might be 9, this number is 0. You plug them into this equation, it'll work as well, as long as you square negative 3 and make this positive 9. Okay. Next one you want to try over here, try and see if it's factorable. We're going to go ahead and break this down, and we say, uh, we got 3x squared, and 3. You know what? I ditched a problem that, oh, you know what? That one was a, that was a linear problem. Never mind. Forget I said anything. Um, 3x squared and a 3. I want two numbers that add to 10, and they multiply to, check this out, 3 times 3. Whatever 3 times 3 is, this times this gives you the same number. That must be 9. Two numbers that multiply to 9 and add to 10, 9 and 1. So these are factorable. Oops. Uh, so you got 9x and you got 1x. Now you have breakdowns of x here, x and x. And you want to, how do I say this? Uh, x times x is x squared, but what times what gives you 3? Well, 3 times 1. So you've got to figure out where this 3 goes. Like what if I put the 3 up here and the 1 right here? Problem is, 3 times, there's no integer you can multiply 3 with to get 1, so it doesn't look like it fits there. It looks like the 3 might fit over here. Because 3 times 3x times 3x is, or excuse me, 3x times 3 is 9x, so that helps. 1x times 1 is 1x, so it looks like this factor is a little better this way. So your final factor is 3x plus 1 times 1x plus 3 equals 0. Uh, if that's the case, 0 product property, once again, either 3x plus 1 equals 0, or... 1x plus 3, which is x. x plus 3 equals 0. So either 3x equals negative 1, or an x equals negative 1 third, or uh, x equals negative 3. So those are your two solutions there. And once again, those would work in the original equation. Uh, I don't know if I have a quadratic formula problem after this, so I figured I'll make this one. Quadratic formula. I'm going to go ahead and do one with you here. I'll do this one right here. I'm going to make a equal to 3, b equal to 10, and c equal to 3. Quadratic formula only works in a quadratic equation and if it's written in the standard form of a quadratic equation such as this, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. That allows you to use a, b, and c. That does not look like a 3. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do quadratic formula one more time for you all. This time I'll actually get a solution. And this is what quadratic formula looks like if you need to sing it. x equals minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And there you go. Um, I'm going to start in the discriminant like I have the last time. I'm going to do b squared minus 4ac. b squared is 100. Minus 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 9 is 36. 100 minus 36 equals 64. Now, when I do my quadratic formula in here, I'm going to do x equals negative, let's see, b is 10, negative b plus or minus. Here's where you're going to get the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Notice I already did that. The square root of 64 is 8, and that'll be all over 2a. So when I solve for x, there are two different equations here. Either x will equal negative 10 plus 8 over 2 times 3 is 6, or x will equal negative 10 minus 8 over 6. That's the plus or minus portion of this. It's actually two solutions. As you clearly saw, there were two solutions. Um, so either x equals negative 2 over 6, which is negative 1 third, as we saw that answer before up above. I'll show you again. Or x equals negative 10 minus, oh, whoops, where did you do that? Negative 18 over 6, which is negative 3, which I think that was the other answer we got. And once again, I can't do my 3s. So if I look up above, once again, those, those two solutions are right there. Negative 1 third, boom, boom. Negative 3, boom, boom. Quadratic formula is a surefire method of doing it if it's not factorable. We did not run into a problem on this that was not factorable, at least not the one I gave you. Okay. Um, going back. 
We're going to find two solutions here. Now, these are values of x when y equals 0. In other words, if we had some ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, we, this was originally an equation like that. Then we found out what x was when y was 0. Here were our two solutions, x equals 2 and x equals 5. This, I got to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. I need some water. Ah, okay. Whew. This looks, huh. this looks just like two solutions that we got on the other page. Like over here, x equals this or that, x equals this or that. Whenever we solve for x in these things, these are your x-intercepts. So you notice why I did this one first, because I want to go back and say, these are x-intercepts. What I want to do now, is I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to solve, I'm going to start for my solutions, write them as factors, put it in factored form, distribute it back into this kind of equation, and then I'm going to make it a y equals function, because that's what, obviously that's what the graph is. You need values of y, not just when x equals zero. So it's kind of a harder problem. I'm not expecting you to do this kind of problem, so to speak, but I am expecting you to understand all these different facets of these problems, meaning these are x-intercepts, five-point method we might do, you know, stuff like that. How to distribute. So if x equals 2 and x equals 5, I'm going to rewrite that. The factors were going to be x minus 2 equals 0 or x minus 5 equals 0. So write it in factored form. That's x minus 2 times x minus 5 equals 0. Right? That, that's what you could have solved for. And as we multiply these, that's going to be x squared. You know, okay, I'll use a generic rectangle for you. Um, x minus 2, x minus 5. That becomes x squared minus 5x minus 2x plus 10. So x squared minus 5x minus 2x plus 10, um, not really equals 0 anymore, right? It's all about making this equation. So it's going to be a y equals equation. So I'll make it y equals. So this equation then could be y equals x squared minus 7x plus 10. And that would be your equation for this graph over here. Um, now, it did say find a possible equation. Okay, this is definitely a quadratic. This definitely has these factors. So this is but one equation. The only other equations that could possibly be, excuse me, possibly be, is if you, is if you wanted to put any more additional multipliers in there. Like if you wanted to double all of your numbers. Um, man, that sneeze really bugged me. If you want to double all your numbers, if you want to triple all your, oh, that should be a 20. If you want to triple all your numbers, stuff like that. I'm not expecting you to, Jeez, I'm not expecting you to uh, go all out like that, even if you had this kind of problem. But those are the only possible equations for the scenario. And if you notice, another thing that could help you is knowing that the y-intercepts should be positive. Look how these y-intercepts should be positive right here. And obviously, x equals 2 and 5 need to work when y equals 0. Okay, I think I'm on the last problem. I am. Awesome. Last problem. It's a big one. But this is kind of five-point method-y. Um, they ask you a bunch of questions that you would do with a five-point method. Now, five-point method, I don't want to call anything by what it is with five-point method. What I want to do is get you to understand that there are five points that you can find easily on a graph if you know your um, y-intercept. That's one. X-intercepts, that's two, possibly. Vertex, that's three. And then last one would be a corresponding point. Um, we'll get to that. So here we go. Other things that are important are knowing which way your shape's gonna, what your shape is, and all this. This is a quadratic. Um, what is the shape of the graph? It is a parabola, or a U-shaped, or a U-shape. What part of the equation makes this the quadratic term? That quadratic term is called x squared. I think this works. X squared. There we go. X squared. Okay, um, should the graph go up or down? Clearly explain how you know. The graph should go upward because the x, the quadratic, the x squared term 
is positive. Okay. As long as your x squared term, your leading term in the quadratic equation is positive, that'll be going upward. You can test a lot of points. You'll always get that. Always, always, always. Okay, what are the coordinates of the y-intercept? Clearly explain and show how you find your answer. Really, it's, it's the value of y when x equals 0, and it, this is almost too much overkill to do this step. When x equals 0, y is just going to be the c value. Remember, this is ax squared plus bx plus c. In a quadratic equation, when you're written in standard form, your y-intercept is going to be c, this last guy right here. 0 squared is 0, 6, negative 6 times 0 is 0, 0 plus 8 is 8. Your y value is 8, so the y-intercept, what are the coordinates, are 0, 8. It's the value of y when x equals 0. And really, that's all you need to explain. Same with x-intercept, is the values of x when y equals 0. The only difference is you got to do a little more work for this one. So to solve for your x-intercept here, Check and see if it's factorable. If so, go ahead and factor. It is. Um, I'm not going to do diamond stuff with you on this one. I want you to trust me on my work. I want you to try and do it on your own. My time is short these days. Um, zero product property will get you to solve that either x equals 4 or x equals 2. Now, they do ask you for the coordinates, which means the coordinates of this is 4, 0, or 2, 0. And really, those are, it's really an and at that point. The coordinates are 4, 0, and 2, 0. How do you know? It's the values of x and y equals 0. But I showed it. Right? I did the math to show it. What are the coordinates of the vertex? Um, this is going to help for me to do part of the graph right now. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm going to plot some of these points. I need to start with my scale because it's only nice to do that because I always ask you guys to do it. These are going to go up every... Or, you know, these are going to go every, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So this scale is going to be normal, like every increment is 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, this can be 5 right there. You only need one number. These ones, let's see what I really want. 0, 8, 4, 2. Let's see if I go up every 8 like this, every 2 increments. I, I like to not have any white space. That might be pretty good might help me a little bit on my graph. Will that? Let's see, what do I have? 4, 0, 2, 0. You know what? I'm going to do it normally. Forget I said anything. I'm, I'm just trying to be picky with how much white space I might have. I'm going to go up every 5. I'll do it over here. Actually. 10, 6, 5, 10. Um, <laughs> that scared me. Um, all right. Why did I say I was going to graph first? Check this out. I plot a few of my points. There's my y-intercept at 0, 8. My x-intercepts are at 4, 0, and 2, 0. Remember when I talked about corresponding points? X-intercepts will always be corresponding points for a parabola. Um, my parabola will do, I'm not going to graph it really fully yet, but my parabola is going to do something like this, right? Whatever. It's going to be some U-shape. It's going to go down and hit down and come back up. My vertex is going to be below the x-axis. It's going to be between, literally right in the middle of these two points because parabolas are symmetrical. And there is what's called an axis of symmetry. And the axis of symmetry goes between any corresponding points. Because I have corresponding points for x at 4, 0, and 2, 0, then I know that my axis of symmetry is going to be at x equals 3. Right? It's the average of 4 and 2. I know my vertex is going to be on the line somewhere x equals 3. That's what's going to help me find my vertex. How so? Well, my equation, if you look right here, is x squared minus 6x plus 8. How do I find the, va find the value of y when x equals 3? Substitute 3 for x. You're going to get y equals 9 minus 18 plus 8. So 9 minus 18 is negative 9. Negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1. So your coordinates of your vertex are 3, negative 1. So I don't know. Maybe you luckily landed on the point. I don't know. But this point is right there at 3, negative 1 for the vertex. Now, not only did that help me find my vertex, but notice how I talked about corresponding points. There's a point that's one unit away at the height of 0 in both directions. There's also another point 
if I don't use a table, I don't have to. One, two, three units away at a height of eight, there's also going to be one, two, three units away. This is that fifth point that's called the corresponding point right there for that value. And that value is at six, eight. Not that that matters, but, you know, whatever. Um, they only ask you to find those four points, but really that fifth point is really nice to have. And to top this off, I'm going to do a very bad-looking graph. Oh, boy, that I, just, I know that started off terrible. It's very hard to do this. I'm going to zoom in. Maybe that'll make it a little bit better. But I'm buying time here. This is literally the last problem, literally the last part. I don't want to do anything else. I am tired. Ah! I got a long day ahead of me. Oh, that didn't make it any better. Uh, and put a curve, you know. Uh, okay, I'm going to make this good. I'm going to do it kind of sketchy. Like, like, not like sketch. But I'm going to like sketch it out like, you know, you do. That doesn't work. <laughs> you know how like <laughs> sketch artists kind of like like that? Yeah, that's a that's a nice looking thing. If I had a pencil, I could make it look really nice here. Oh, yeah, there's a parabola, man. Oh, man, this ain't your daddy's parabola. This is Mr. Robinson's parabola right here. It actually looks kind of cool. What I was going to try and do is use this curve tool, and, like, that probably would have been a lot better, but it wouldn't really hit the points right. Anyway, you see what the gist of this thing looks like. It's, um, there it is. Woo! All good. All right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to tell you all good luck. Good luck. I'm going to zoom back in because it was right in the corner. It looks kind of cool. Good luck. I wonder if you would have seen that. Bye.